but what effects do a series of deeply empathic responses have upon the recipient? Here the evidence is quite overwhelming. From schizophrenic patients to pupils in ordinary classrooms, from clients of a counseling center to teachers in training, from neurotics in Germany to neurotics in the United States, empathy is clearly related to positive outcome. There are just many studies that, that indicate that. Uh, Bergen and Strupp uh, summarize it by saying that various studies demonstrate a positive correlation between therapist empathy, patient self-exploration, and independent criteria of patient change. Uh, so that you could say empathy and process and outcome are all positively related. But I believe that we haven't paid perhaps enough attention to that. And I want to discuss it more now from uh, perhaps a clinical point of view. I was going to say subjective. Maybe maybe clinical would be a better term. What what is the effect on the on the person who's who is the recipient of a high degree of of empathic listening? In the first place, it dissolves alienation. For the moment, at least, the recipient finds himself a connected part of the human race. Though he may not articulate it clearly, his experience goes something like this. I've been talking about hidden things, partly veiled even from myself, feelings that are strange, possibly abnormal, feelings I've never communicated to another, not even clearly to myself. And yet he or she has understood, understood them even more clearly than I do. If he knows what I'm talking about, what I mean, then to this degree I'm not so strange or so alien or set apart. I make sense to another human being. So I am in touch with, even in relationship with others. I am no longer an isolate. Perhaps that explains one of the major findings of our study of psychotherapy with schizophrenics. We found that those patients receiving from their therapists a high degree of accurate empathy, as rated by unbiased judges, showed the sharpest reduction in schizophrenic pathology as measured by the MMPI. This suggests that sensitive understanding by another may have been the most potent element in bringing the schizophrenic out of his estrangement and into the world of relatedness. Jung has said that the schizophrenic ceases to be schizophrenic when he meets someone by whom he feels understood. And our study provides empirical evidence in support of that statement. Other studies, both of schizophrenics and of counseling center clients, show that low empathy is related to a slight worsening in adjustment or pathology. Uh, here, too, the findings make sense, I think, though it's, though it's uh, sobering sense to think that we may make people worse by, by not offering a high degree of empathy. But one of uh, Ronald Lang's patients states vividly, his experience uh, in contacts, earlier contacts with psychiatrists. He says, it's a most terrifying feeling to realize that the doctor can't see the real you, that he can't understand what you feel, and that he's just going ahead with his own ideas. Beautiful description. The patient says, I would start to feel that I was invisible, or maybe not there at all. I think that's, that's why it would have a worsening effect to feel if I'm not understood, and he's going off on his own track, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm horrible, maybe I'm so abnormal, nobody can understand me. Another meaning of empathic understanding to the recipient is that someone values him, cares, accepts the person that he is. And it might seem here that we've stopped talking about empathy and are talking about, about caring, but that's not quite so. It's impossible accurately to sense the perceptual world of another person unless you see that, unless you value that person and his world, unless you in some sense care. Hence the message comes through to the recipient that this other individual values me, thinks I'm worthwhile, perhaps I am worth something, perhaps I could value myself, perhaps I could care for myself. And I'd like to give 
a somewhat lengthy example of this from a young man who's been a recipient of much sensitive understanding and who's now in the later stages of therapy. I've used this example before, but to me it's a gem that is worth repeating. Client says, I could even conceive of it as a possibility that I could have a kind of tender concern for me. Still, how could I be tender, be concerned for myself, when they're one and the same thing? But yet I can feel it so clearly. You know, like taking care of a child. You want to give it this and give it that. I can kind of clearly see the purposes for somebody else, but I can never see them for myself, that I could do this for me, you know. Is it possible that I can really want to take care of myself and make that a major purpose of my life? That means I'd have to deal with the whole world as if I were the guardian of the most cherished and most wanted possession, that this I was between this precious me that I wanted to take care of and the whole world. It's almost as if I loved myself. You know, that's strange. But it's true. The therapist says, it seems such a strange concept to realize. It would mean I would face the world as though a part of my primary responsibility was taking care of this precious individual who is me, whom I love. The client goes right on, whom I care for, whom I feel so close to. Oof, that's another strange one. The therapist says, it just seems weird. Client, yeah, it hits rather close somehow. The idea of my loving me and the taking care of me. That's a very nice one, very nice. It is, I believe, the therapist's caring understanding exhibited in this excerpt as well as previously, which has permitted this client to experience a high regard, even a love for himself. Still another impact of a sensitive understanding comes from its non-judgmental quality. The highest expression of empathy is accepting and non-judgmental. This is true because it's impossible to be accurately perceptive of another's inner world if you have formed an, evalu an evaluative opinion of him. If you doubt this statement, choose someone whom you know, with whom you deeply disagree, and who is, in your judgment, <clears throat> definitely wrong or mistaken. Now try to state his views, beliefs, feelings, so accurately that he will agree that this is a sensitively correct description of his stance. If you're like me, I think you will find that nine times out of ten you will be unable to do that if you feel judgmental toward this, toward this person. Because your judgment of his views creeps into your perception and description of them. Consequently, true empathy is always free of any evaluative or diagnostic quality. This comes across to the recipient with some surprise. If I'm not being judged, perhaps I'm not so evil or abnormal as I've thought. Perhaps I don't have to judge myself so harshly. Thus, gradually, the possibility of self-acceptance is increased. Perhaps another way of putting some of what I've been saying is that a finely tuned understanding by another individual gives the recipient his personhood, his identity. Lang has said that the, the sense of identity requires the existence of another by whom one is known. And Buber has also spoken of the need to have our existence confirmed by another. Empathy gives that needed confirmation that one does exist as a separate, valued person with an identity. I think when a person's selfhood or identity is pretty tentative or not very strong, um, I question whether he can achieve a real identity without someone understanding him. I do regard it as quite possible when he's developed a strong selfhood, really feels confidence in himself, then he might be able to affirm some new facet of himself without anyone else understanding it. At least that seems to me like a hypothetical uh, possibility. And yet, uh, 
for myself, I guess it comes home to me mostly with, with new ideas. Um, I can only affirm them tentatively until someone else has understood them. Then they seem to become much more possible, much more, uh, much more, and I'm much more capable of affirming them then if, if, if they've proved really understandable to someone else. And I don't just mean intellectually understandable, but really understandable at some gut level. Let me turn to a more specific result of an interaction in which the individual feels understood. He finds himself revealing material he has never communicated before, and in the process he discovers a previously unknown element in himself. Such an element may be, I never knew before that I was angry at my father, or I never realized that I'm afraid of succeeding. Such discoveries are unsettling but exciting. To perceive a new aspect of oneself is the first step toward changing the concept of oneself. The new element is in an understanding atmosphere owned and assimilated into a now altered self-concept. This is the basis, in my estimation, of the behavior changes which come about as a result of therapy or groups and so on. Once the self-concept changes, behavior changes to match the freshly perceived self. Then, if we think, however, that empathy is effective only in the one-to-one -one relationship that we call psychotherapy, we are greatly mistaken. Even in the classroom, it makes an important difference. When the teacher shows evidence that he or she understands the meaning of classroom experiences for the student, learning improves. In a study made by Aspie, it was found that children's reading improved significantly more when teachers exhibited a high degree of understanding than in classrooms where such understanding did not exist. To me, that's not surprising. Just as the client in psychotherapy finds that empathy provides a climate for learning more of himself, so the student in the classroom finds himself in a climate for learning subject matter when he is in the presence of an understanding teacher. And just recently, after I'd written this, uh, I received a new manuscript by Aspie, which summarizes almost a dozen years of work, now covers several countries, thousands of pupils and teachers, uh, many, many classrooms, and what I've said here is more than borne out by the much further extended research. So I had some copies of that, with his permission, run off, and you'll find those uh, in the office. And those of you in education, I think, would be quite interested. Again, not necessarily surprised. It's what we would like to believe. It's what we think when we, when we try to be human in the classroom. But it's the kind of evidence that you can show to your board of trustees or to your principal or whatnot. It is. Uh, evidence that being human, being understanding, really pays in, in, the, in the classroom in, in many other ways than just uh, learning subject matter, too. Thus far, I've spoken of the more obvious change-producing effects of empathy. I should like to turn to an aspect having to do with the dynamics of personality. I'll make several brief statements and then endeavor to explain their meaning and, and significance. 